Overrated, underrated, or you can say perfectly rated for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles edition. Overrated. <laughs> yeah, sorry, this is a little out of left field, but hey, we're going to throw this out here. Overrated, underrated, Leonardo. Perfectly. Why is that? <laughs> I'm going to say that for all the characters. <laughs> oh, come on. I love Everyone, the turtles. I, <laughs> I, love, I, love, I think they all complement each other. You can't have one without the other. They make the perfect turtle. Right, because they all have that individual personality that provides both conflict and symmetry. And I think when collectively they make the perfect unit at the same time, you know, it's like brothers, you know, you're going to have that sibling rivalry and you're going to have differences of opinion. But when it comes down to it together, they're undefeated. You separate them and then, you know, they're, they're challenged. What's up, everybody? My name is Sam, uh, creator of There's an Alien in My Toilet, now on Kickstarter. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a talented creator of a comic that is really interesting. It's fun. It has a great young adult feel to it. It is an amazing read from what I've got to see so far. But he's also a podcast host as well, too. So he's very multi-talented in his own creativity we're joined today by the ever talented samuel vera from there's an alien in my toilet which i still think is an amazing title how are you doing today good yourself doing good doing good as of this interview your campaign is successfully funded so congratulations on that thank you thank you yeah yeah it was a it's a it's a grind duty and i are out there you know spreading news <laughs> <laughs> for those that don't know anything of course about there's an alien in my toilet and about yourself. Tell us who you are and, and what this project is all about. Well, my name is Samuel. Um, I've, I created uh, Duty back in 2005. Basically, it's, uh, it's about this egocentric, thinks he knows it all, alien who's on this secret mission to Earth um, to determine if we're a threat to his homeworld. At least that's what he's led to believe. Uh, General Goatee, who commands the army of Uranus, um, is responsible for babysitting Duty because Duty's father is the emperor. So duty spoiled and, um, you know, he's led to believe that he is the best thing uh, since sliced bread. So in duty's arrogance, arrogance and haste, um, he boards his ship and heads to earth. Doesn't realize he forgot to refuel. So he crash lands. And instead of admitting his mistake, he chalks it up as this was part of his plan to infiltrate earth's defenses and distract them. And uh, so now he has to survive Earth's simple creatures from uh, wolves to woodpeckers to bears, eventually getting into a house where there's a chihuahua named Herman who believes that duty is a talking jalapeno. And that's where the adventure begins. Looking at then this, this world that you've created, uh, what did you draw from to create it? Well, my influences stem since I was a child. Um, you know, uh, I was a big Fraggle Rock um, mm. fan and uh, Marvin the Martian fan of a huge ALF fan. Um, you know, uh, I was a big fan of Too Close for Comfort, uh, where the father was an illustrator and he drew a comic strip called cosmic cow so you know in hindsight when i'm looking back at all the, the, the influences it, it came from all of those um, um amazing brands and uh, uh the creators that uh, gave life to them you can never go wrong with anything jim henson has put together with fraggle rock and the muppets and oh, all other stuff just, just awesome. so so good we're missing that in this day and age <laughs> yes absolutely well, now that you have a, a comic book itself here, you, you mentioned the character's name of, of Duty, and I, I love it. And nameology to me is, is rather interesting, especially when it comes from a creative perspective, though. How did you come up with this name? He came to me. Um, so in 05, uh, there was an editor for a newspaper that approached us and said, hey, if you have a sci-fi comedy comic strip, um, we'll be willing to publish it. And I happened to be driving through the Lincoln Tunnel in New Jersey, and Bam, um, he just appeared in my head and says, hi, I'm Duty from Uranus. And that's how it started. And uh, so I went to IHOP, met my buddies, and I was like, look, I got the next best thing. It's going to be Duty. And they thought it was just nuts. And um, so I started illustrating um, uh, his first rendition, and Duty told me that's not what I look like. And so uh, he doesn't look anything like that first draft on the, the uh, table napkin at IHOP. And that's how um, he came to be. But the name itself, though, like seems perfect, especially with the theme of the, of the comic itself here, too. Speaking of themes in general, though, what theme when you were, 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 you were getting hit over the head with this character uh, did you come up with that kind of really inspired you to keep this story fresh and alive? 
his, his, his imagination, it, it's duty. So in reality, duty basically um, is not as smart as he believes he is and is not as uh, tactical or strategic as he believes he is. Um, so he always finds himself um, falling unconscious, whether it's because he got knocked off a tree by a woodpecker or um, maybe because he tripped over a rock and hit his head. But then when he's in his dream state, now he imagines himself to be that larger than life figure that he wished he could be in reality. And so, you know, there's a, there's a scene in, in the series where um, he's attacked by red ants and, um, you know, he falls unconscious because he's running for them. And um, then he becomes a samurai and the ants become ninja mm-hmm. and, he, and he has to do battle with the ninja. And so in every issue, in issue two, duty takes on different personas. Um, and when he falls unconscious... And in his dream, um, he is the victor. But in reality, it's anything but. It also gives you the the fact that you can take a character and just kind of explore your own creativity and and the different aspects that you enjoy, uh, not only as a geek, uh, but as a comic creator as well, too. So I I love that. I I think I also saw things like The Matrix and a few other areas of of wonderful pop culture as well, too. Yes, because the first issue is called First Flush. And so you can't have first flush without an homage cover to first blood Rambo. So, and that's where that came from. And I'm a big matrix fan. And, um, and, uh, so I thought it would be a great play on the matrix. Um, but then there's also an homage cover to teenage mutant Ninja turtles issue number 30. Um, I'm a, I love the turtles and, um, I just love that cover. And I thought it was a great way to introduce duty to reintroduce duty to a new generation of uh, readers, um, with that cover. So then, how did these fractured personalities of duty come into play when you were writing the actual series? Duty, what well, is the comedic aspect for um, Disney Le Mai Tola. I think we all have a duty within us where, you know, sometimes we believe that we're smarter than we are or um, that we can take on any situation. And that's duty. You know, he has this, you know, can't fail attitude, even though he continues to fail. Um, <laughs> And he keeps pushing and moving forward no matter what. And he finds some way through sarcasm to rationalize his defeat so it doesn't appear as if it was. Um, And I just think that's what's brilliant about the character um, because it's the arrogance and the the pride. His pride just won't let him fail. Do you find that pride gets in the way of creativity? It can stunt somebody's creativity, yes. I think um, you have to, if you're not a sponge to life, you will stunt your growth. Like for instance, the way duty um, is developed, I illustrate and then the dialogue comes as I'm illustrating. Um, very different from other projects I've worked on where I would write the script out. I have the, the Bible, the timeline, the character, all that stuff's already pre-written. And so I just open up the script and I just illustrate to, uh, to the direction that I gave myself. Where duty, it's um, I don't touch the page until he speaks to me. And then I start illustrating. And as I'm drawing the scenes, the dialogue comes and I write it in pencil on there. And then afterwards, I give it to George, who's my letterer, and he'll just take those um, chicken scratch and put them in word balloons. Actually, that's a good good segue. Going into your actual team itself, then uh, obviously you, you are the creator itself, but who else is, is helping you? Yeah, so George letters the book and he also did the first cover, the one that you see Duty Underwater. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he did that variant cover. And that's rare because George gave up illustrating um, back, uh, what, 12 years ago. You know, to get a George Medina cover, it's a prized possession um, because now he's just stuck to writing because he has his own book called Wonder Duck. So he does the lettering. And then I have a young lady named Barbara Sirogi from Brazil who does my coloring and everything else is done by me. So how did you find these individuals then? Well, George and I met at the School of Visual Arts Continuing Education course. We were in a life drawing class. And um, how that conversation started with me and George was the, 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 the class was, you know, it was all male models. And, I'll, you know, at, at a certain point, you're like, you know what, I'm done with this. So I turned my chair. <laughs> I said, I'm not looking at you anymore. I'm looking at George. And I was like, hey. And I noticed he had a little uh, ash can comic strip that he did with a, a duck. So I started talking to him about my imprint, Crazy Comics, that I was starting. I was like, hey, you want to get down? And we, we talked about it. And then that's how we started working together. And uh, our first issues, our first books were Cosmic Wars by me and Rush 5377 by George. And we've been working together since and up until 2008. And then I left the industry for a while. 
I mean, it's a wonderful to find a a creative uh, individual, especially in in life drawing classes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I remember those days well uh, behind the behind the canvas and in front of the canvas. So yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, the teacher was obnoxious. He would set up a table in front, and then he would grab a chair and put it on top of the table, and tell this naked poor soul to climb on top of the table and on the chair and do this awkward pose. Mm-hmm. And I remember. We were getting up to walk on break and the guy's trying to come down and he slipped and he was yeah. about to, he was going to fall. And I was like, and my instant reaction was to catch him. And I said, Oh no, I can't. I said, this is a meme and there's no way I'm catching this guy. So I was like, he's going to have to fall. And I just kept walking. <laughs> when it comes to then, uh, you know, this campaign, is this your first Kickstarter campaign? Uh, for Disney on my tour, that is not my first uh, rodeo. I've um, we launched Cast the Crazies, um, three issues a year ago, um, which is basically lo- loosely based on us, on our story, George and I, as uh, podcasters and comic creators, and our journey into comics, how I left the industry, how he remained in the industry, we returned, and uh, we're not as successful as we were ten years ago. And so I go off, my character goes into the woods and it shouts out to the universe says, help us become the greatest podcasters in the world. And so the universe answers in the form of the crazy man. He's a hippie, Afro, bare bottom wearing um, supernatural being from another universe. And he comes with the crazies. And the crazies are these little mythical creatures and they go around bopping people over the heads with microphones. And now they're addicted to our show and they're walking around like zombies. And then we eventually become invest under investigation because now, you know, we're getting millions of subscribers and the people you know, and people are walking around like zombies and they're trying, they're trying to link it to us. So now we have to try to catch the crazies and stop it from happening. <laughs> so then how has being a podcaster and, and a comic creator helped you in terms of your creativity and your mental health? Uh, the, the the podcasting allows me to break away and and uh, talk to a lot of creatives out there and just see things from different perspectives and see what's happening in the industry and just give you know shine a light on heroes that are out there you know fighting the good fight and trying to make something of their brands and um, and it's just it's it's that's my escape um, so um, you know because we have a show five days a week and. Um, so in between, so I, I, those, those moments where I get to sit down and just um, be the spectator and, and uh, a supporter of my comrades out there, um, that helps me with my creativity. So then when I see something that's from a, a first perspective or I see or someone who's passionate, who's really got their, their finger on the pulse and they're doing some, you know, something special, it just motivates me. Um, so when I go back to my um, uh, the, to the lab and I'm creating um, it helps me just, uh, it's the charcoal that goes into the furnace. So then what's the most uh, misunderstood aspect about being a creative person, either in comics or in podcasting? The most misunderstood? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think it's um, inconsistency and uh, you're just a flash in the pants. Uh, you, you, you're doing, you, you just, you're here today, you're gone tomorrow. I think that's, um, and it's just, it, it's, it's a reputation that the independent community has. Um, and so, um, I think, you know, since we've come back in 2019, we've never missed an episode. Uh, we're about to celebrate episode 400. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, in the beginning, people probably thought they didn't know that we created Cast the Craze back in 2006 and um, into a lot of success early on. And we just, I just gave everything up. I walked away from it. Um, and so we, we, we weren't new to the game, um, but we were new to the new world of podcasting because everything's changed over that time. Um, and, uh, but we had the formula. Jordan and I have uh, great chemistry. Um, um, there's a lot of humor and, um, and we and we, we share some of those uh, learnings um, and, and those you know, pitfalls um, with our audience and we're very transparent about it. So I think overcoming the stigma of, you know, you're just one of many, or you're going to be gone tomorrow. I think that's probably the most misunderstood part. What was a, an early experience where you learned that language had power? <sighs> it must have been in, when I was in, in, um, in retail. It wasn't, I remember when I was young, I, you know, I was very, you know, I was on my own since I was 18. My mom passed away. And so it was me 
and my kid sister and my sister was a team with a baby. And so, um, you know, everything, you know, was dependent on being able to bring in an income. And so I remember learning to grow up fast and realizing the power of how you say things, not what you say. It's how you structure it and how you approach it. And, um, I, you know, I made mistakes and that's how, and that's how I recognize why do I keep getting this result when I'm, my intention is to get this result and I have to self-reflect. And that's a hard thing to do. And once I was able to internally look at my delivery and my approach and my maturity, um, I honed in on that. And I said, I need to, and, and I looked at who did it well. And that's when I started listening to like motivational speakers and reading a lot of books. And I said, all right, who does it well? And how do I tap into that? And it was actually, I was watching always Steve Jobs when he was giving his speeches um, for every annual for the Apple releases and how poised he was and how everyone was just hanging on every word, his delivery, um, you know, the pacing. And I was like, oh, there's the master. There's the prototype. How do I try to achieve that? And then once that happened, I, um, everything just started falling into place. What I wanted mentally, I was able to achieve physic you know, physically and um, verbally. Um, and it was, just, it was just starting to link up. So then what's your creative kryptonite? I create time. Time and patience. Um, I think I get uh, frustrated. Uh, number one, I feel there's never enough time. Um, and uh, because I have, I'm multitasking, you know, um, trying to grow and launch this podcast at the same time, trying to grow um, duty as a, a, li a lifestyle brand. It, you know, it's not just a comic book. It's, you know, it's a role playing game. It's a, uh, it's coloring books, activity books, you know, there's a whole lot with it. Um, and so trying to build that simultaneously and build the, the podcast while trying to, trying to be a good husband um, and, and, and uh, a good brother and a good friend trying to balance all those things. Um, I get a lot of, I get frustrated because um, I always feel like um, if I stop moving, I'm missing the train. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, I, I think that's for me, that's where I always have to reset. And the way I reset is by walking away, um, you know, either playing with the dogs or spending time with my wife or um, watching something at midnight um, that's going to help me just reset. Like what? Oh, like right now we're watching, um, um, I don't know, Penny's Worth. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Yes. So I just started watching that and, um, um, and I usually watch it between 1130 and 1230 and then I'm asleep. Um, <laughs> but it helps me reset because as I'm watching it, I'm, I'm thinking that's the part I can't stop the thinking. The thinking is constant. And uh, so I'm watching and I'm thinking about what's my next move. What do I, you know, how do I get from here to here? I'm always doing the math in my head. So I think I am my biggest <laughs> critic. And so I'm, a, I'm also my cri kryptonite. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, especially with a podcast and a show. I mean, between getting guests or form or formatting your show or, or the editing process or whatever, like before this interview, I was editing a, a previous interview. So, and I, and I, I have to prep for other interviews in the future try to formulate questions and try to make it interesting enough so that the person eventually comes back you know <laughs> it's one of those things you know what is it about podcasting that that lets you be free when i was young i was very shy i was the kid who always sat in the back of the class i was the kid um, if I was in a restaurant, I wanted to be furthest away from the door towards the back. I wasn't the one who, who readily um, volunteered myself or raised my hand for anything. And I realized that was stunting my growth. And so the, the, I took a, a public speaking course and I started realizing that um, the gift that we were given w was the gift of communication. And that's going to help me achieve what I need in life. And so the podcasting actually freed up my insecurities you know it was me facing my demon and it allowed me to hone in my skills and when i look at the first podcast we ever did versus now i was like man you were so raw but i was a sponge and i was constantly challenging myself to grow if you look at my first podcast i must have said um at least 20 times in a minute and so i think that's one of the things i was very aware of and so I, how do i 
challenge that. So podcasting allows me to work on me at the same time, helping others promote what they do. So then how have you grown as a person because of the podcast? I've learned that my opinion doesn't matter. What matters is the outcome of what I'm trying to do. So when I have a guest, my, my job is not to critique what they do. My job is to give them a platform to shine. And I remember when I was younger, I mean, you grew up, you know, I grew up around bullies and I hated bullies my whole life. And so you, you, you're, you're conditioned to accept someone else's critique of you um, or making fun of you or whatever it was. And it, all it does is destroy character. And so for me, uh, it isn't my place to tell you unless you're asking me for my direct opinion about something. My sole priority is to provide a platform, uh, spotlight you, and let the audience decide whether or not it's right for them. So I am just a funnel. Uh, I am not the one who's going to direct your opinion uh, or influence in any way. You're, you have to shape your own opinion based on the information we provide. That's it. You and I are pretty similar, actually, when it comes to you know, how we got started, because you know, I was an introvert forced to be an extrovert because of the show pretty much. <laughs> and it's difficult. I mean, I, I look at the first, we were doing two to four hour interviews wow. w- with guests. Uh, we started a couple of years after you, 2008. And I look back at some of those and I'm just like, how did we do it? Like <laughs> why? I know why we did it because we wanted to showcase talented people in the, in the comic industry, uh, right. mainly web comics. But it, it came back to, I listen to him and I'm just like, oh, I, I don't even want to release, re-release it. <laughs> yeah, there's, I have at least 75 that I haven't really re-released because I was like, you know what, they're staying. There. And then some of it is just so outlandish, um, you know, and there's some things that, you know, I like, I will get canceled for that one. <laughs> I was like, no, that's not being aired. I'm not, I'm not airing that one. So there's an archive where I just won't release them at all. <laughs> Technology has changed, but people have, uh, cr- there are more creative people nowadays and more access to these people that are creative than we've ever seen. I mean, it's, it's amazing because of social media, the, the ability to get people on the show uh, or on your own show, uh, however you do your promotion is, is amazing. I think it's just, uh, it's a lot better and the talent is just so incredible. Absolutely. I think the game has changed significantly. Um, the resources are there. Technology has made things easier. Um, I mean, I've never seen so many talented colorists in my mm. life. They're, they're like everywhere. I'm like, how did the hell? I said, I'm still learning how to color. And uh, so, you know, so when you see that, one of the things that happened when, when the, with the lockdown is that grandmother now has a podcast and, and your two-year-old has a podcast, you know, playing with the sandbox. Everybody has a podcast. So, so I think once things start, you know, normalizing itself, those who just did it because they needed something to do with the time because they was locked at home, those, they will fade away. And those who are really doing it because they, they love it and they want to build a business from it, they will, they will start um, capitalizing on those avoided spots, slots. And, um, um, but the, 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 the vast amount of talent that I've seen. I mean, we, we, when we came back, I think the first three months we sought out talent. We haven't sought out talent since. Um, it's just, they just come and they come and they, I'm like, it, and I've never heard of, you know, these girls and these guys. And, and it's fascinating how quickly they're able to put together a property and uh, promote it. It's fascinating. I've run into so many new people that I would have never have even thought of what genres they're even doing. Like the mixture of genres these days compared to the standard action yeah. fantasy, whatever is, is incredible. Like, I love it. It's, it's great. It's a good time to be a geek. <laughs> yes. Yes. Although the whole, uh, I have a podcast is like saying you were a DJ in the nineties when everyone was a DJ. So yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, the, you know the, the, I think that, I always say to George, the strongest are going to survive um, yeah. the long term. It's a long game. It's not a short game. What was the first comic book that made you cry? Cry? Comic book? Wow. Uh, hmm. I don't know if crying is or, but it did spark an emotion. It was um, 
the Wolverine, man, I forgot. It was the Wolverine where his dad or his brother, I forget what it was that was killed. It was his backstory. Mm-hmm. Um, I forgot the issue. It was a long time ago. That was the one that sparked an emotion for me. Um, but cry, mostly movies. I cry a lot for movies. But my comic books, I, other than that one, I don't remember anyone really hitting close to home. Okay, which movie made you cry? Oh, everybody, every movie. I mean, I cried at ET. I cried at oh, Braveheart. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I I cried at the Never Ending Story. I oh, mean, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm a mush. <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> Look, okay, you, and even Willow to a certain extent as well too. If you want to go that far back, but if you don't cry at Never Ending Story, you're not human. Seriously, no, like you're not like, human. It's a it's a beautiful story. Uh, I I could watch that over and over yeah. again. At what point are we good enough? I think when you understand your self worth, you know, it's not about someone else's opinion of you. It's about how you see yourself when you look in the mirror, when you expose yourself and you're vulnerable to you and you can actually see you. When you accept you and the gifts and the talent that you have, then you are good enough. And then what happens is your creativity will benefit from your confidence and your self-belief. Do you think someone can be a, a creative person either in podcasting or as an, as an interviewer or as a comic book creator if they can't feel emotion? I think empathy is, is critical. Um, you have to be able to put yourself in the, in the, your guest seat and you have to be able to look at things from all sides. Um, I think it would be, I think, uh, people will see through it. And if people can't connect with you on an emotional level, um, that it's going to be a short lived career. So then what in life is beautiful to you? Oh, laughter. I think laughter is the most it is the best gift we've been we've been given. I think um, to hear a child laugh, to hear um, like my mo- my wife has the most beautiful laugh. Um, you know, it's I think the smile and laughter are they're so infectious. They can change your chemical makeup in a second. Um, when someone's if uh, an example, when I was in the corporate world. You know, you go to these meetings and everybody has their head down. They look tense because the, the, the results are less than stellar and whatever. And um, I made it a point to always walk into a room with humor, um, sarcasm. And, and I have this laugh that people always remind me of to change the mood because I can't be in that environment. And I think um, when we understand the power of the smile and laughter, um, we are one step closer to creating the world that we all dream of. So what is the world that you dream? Respect and love. Respect for each other. We're all the same. Doesn't matter what the skin tone looks like. We're all the same. We all have the same aspirations. We all just want to live and, and love. And um, I think, you know, we can do that through laughter and we can do that through smiling and just acknowledgement. What's the second wisest thing someone's ever said to you that has stuck with you in your career? <sighs> It just may be you. And this is when I was in a leadership position and I wasn't getting the reaction from my team. And um, I had a mentor uh, who said, well, it could be you. Before you look at them and they're not accepting of whatever the message is, what's your delivery sound like? Do they believe, do you believe in the message and do they believe you? And so I had to, that's when I bought a book called, um, it was by Robin Sharma, um, the leader who had no title. And I bought that book and I read it and I realized, holy crap, Sam, you're, you're, you are this guy he's talking about. And, um, and I, started, I, I started on a new journey. So sometimes, I, you know, I think we're so conditioned to point. But I think it's harder to turn the finger at yourself and say, yo, what's wrong with you? you, you, need, you know, so I think you have to, the biggest obstacle is always the man in the mirror. And you have to deal with that person before you can deal with the world. What is one mistake that you'll never do again? Um, 
react without information. I know so. I think everyone, you know, you're conditioned to just react to a situation. There's a headline, you react, uh, you form an opinion, but you don't have all the context. I think for me, it's always better off to do your homework, make a, an informed opinion based on the information you were able to collect or refrain from judgment until you have all that information. And so whenever I was presented with a situation or a problem, I would spend more time collecting data and facts and listening to all sides before I come to what I would believe was the underlying root cause to the situation that was currently in my, in my presence. So I think, you know, not reacting, take time and, and learn. I have four last questions to ask, as I do at the end of every interview. It's for a documentary called Little Person Amongst Media Giants that I've been putting together for the past 10 years. <laughs> and I ask this of every creative person that comes on the show. Before I do that, is there anything that I haven't touched upon? And we'll talk about social media and the campaign and where we can support you that way as well, too, at the end of the interview that I haven't touched upon that you'd like those that are watching and listening to this interview. No, I think it's going pretty well. Okay. <laughs> no, that's great. I, I love it. All right. Last, last four questions. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this is great. I love it. I got to get you back on. We, we, we got to do some podcasting, uh, more talks about interviewing and all this other stuff as well, too. Definitely, but definitely. Later on down the road. So okay. if you need a guest, then, but, you know, I'll, Absolutely. I'll, I'll sign up on your form or whatever you have. Just tell me where to go and I'll do it. You got it. All right, last four questions. <laughs> Better do this first. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My mother. Um, she was my best friend. Um, you know, for the 18 years that I had her in my life, uh, she was instrumental in uh, allowing me to grow um, and learn. The reason why I'm able to learn is because of how she approached every situation. She never approached it from the opinionated because I said so, um, whether, whenever there was a scenario that she did not approve of, she, she would have a conversation with me and say, this is my opinion. And this is why I feel this way. But at the end of the day, I want you to make your decision, um, and understand that whatever it is, you have to live with the long-term implications of that decision. And she would have this conversation with me as a child. And, and because of that, she was always my conscience. So whenever I was in a situation where I could have gone left, um, I hear my mom, and it, it directed me um, into a different path. And she was a woman who raised four kids on her own with no high school education. Um, and, you know, I remember the most inspiring thing that, that I've ever seen was she was a security guard. She refused to take public assistance, raising four kids on her own. And then there was an opportunity um, to apply for a, a flight announcer. Um, but you had to speak multiple languages. And for three months, I heard her listening to her tape cassette and she was speaking all these different languages and she got the job. So she went from making, you know, $6 an hour as a security guard to making over $20 an hour with an office. Um, and the office had a back room. So she had microphones and she had computer screens and she would announce the flights in Mandarin and in French. And then on her break, she'd go into behind, there was a door behind her and it was looks like a living room. It had a sofa, it had a stationary bike, it had a refrigerator, it had a kitchen, it had a bathroom, and it had a big view over the runway. And I saw this woman change her life because of her commitment to herself and her family. From a professional perspective, you have created an amazing podcast. You've created some amazing comics with, with George and, of course, with yourself as well, too. And... You've had successful Kickstarters and you've had much success in your professional career. From a personal perspective, do you consider yourself successful? Um, I believe that I have accomplished things that I should not have, given what I've come from. Um, but I refuse to allow myself to be um, to allow myself to use a situation to define me, I needed to divine, define and influence the situation. And so in that aspect, I feel like I've accomplished a lot. Um, where I will feel 100% accomplished is when I complete my mission, which is to create uh, a whole brand with uh, There's Nailing in My Toilet and um, a podcast that, that's 
at least nationally recognized. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Uh, education. Uh, failure is basically you missing something along the way and not recognizing what that was. And so um, we fail on our own merits. It's not because of everything around us. It's the choices we make in the moment um, and uh, acknowledging that. So, you know, all failures that I've had, it was because of a choice I made. You know, you have options and um, they serve as education for me. And um, those are cautionary tales to not be repeated in the future. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator, as a podcaster, or whatever they would like to do creatively. And I hope you have influence uh, over their creativity in, in some positive way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Always remember that when you put yourself in an arena where um, you're dependent on an audience to support your growth, you, th that comes with uh, responsibility and weight. So um, make certain that you give back just as much as you receive. And I think that's the biggest thing. Be open and willing to have a conversation, even if it's inconvenient. Um, be open and willing to uh, provide direction or lend a hand, even when it doesn't suit your own purpose. Um, because just as easy as those who are supporting you and buying your books or subscribing to you, they, it can, they can also disappear. So um, the best thing you could do is just inspire future growth because that next person is going to be the one that takes it to another level and, and, and reinvent the wheel. So you never know. Um, the worst thing you could do is say no. Uh, it, that's, a, that's a really dangerous word. And I try to um, make certain that uh, I honor my commitment to myself by always being able to give back. Well, I do hate to say this, Samuel, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, you, you survived, so congratulations. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And, and where can we find the Kickstarter as well, too? The Kickstarter, it's uh, there's an alien on my toilet on Kickstarter. You can go to crazycomics.com or icreatestories.com. And crazy is with two E's, not a Y. Um, and you, go th you can go there and there's a link there or directly on Kickstarter and just type in there's an alien in my toilet. Um, and you can find me on social media at catch the craze and it's anywhere. Um, I'm on 12 different social media platforms as catch the craze. And that's what a D a, not a T H E. And, um, you know, my channel, we, you know, catch the craze podcast. It's, um, weekly it's Monday through Friday. Um, there's several different shows on, on catch the craze. There's the craze in 10 less. There's what's in the box. There's the morning brew. There's the Kickstarter, um, show. And there's this, the indie creators interviews every Fridays. Um, and that's how you can find me. Thanks so much, Sam, for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. Of course, as I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that up. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking. Thank you.